The year is 2011, and Bethesda has stopped the industry with an absolute earth-shattering release known as Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, a game so transformative that developers to this day are still citing it as inspiration for their work. The year is 2013, Bethesda has finished their support for Skyrim. We have Dawn Guard, Hearthfire, and Dragonborn, an excellent suite of expansions and brand new content brought to an already amazing game. Now we have Skyrim Legendary Edition. Certainly this is enough for those who are coming in late. The year is 2016. Skyrim is still in our minds, but it's been a little bit. And now we have Special Edition. For those of you who are on the current gen consoles of the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One, this is for you. Have you missed out on Skyrim? Fret not, Bethesda has you covered with a couple of new bells and whistles, tweaks to the lighting, but overall, still the same game with all the DLC packaged in. The year is 2017, Bethesda's done it again, but okay, it's fine. We never had Skyrim on a Nintendo platform. This makes sense. The portability factor is there. Okay, cool. We're good now. The year is still 2017. Skyrim needs to be there in VR. How could I forget? Right. This is the last platform they needed to support. Okay, we're bending the rules a little bit here, but I can deal with this. VR and Skyrim, very cool. The year is 2018, and Bethesda has taken it a step too far. Skyrim Very Special Edition is now available on Alexa, and you can play it right now. The year is fucking 2021. Bethesda has done it again. Skyrim is out again. This time, it's the Anniversary Edition. Okay, if you already had it on Xbox One, PS4, you're good to go. But guess what? If you have a series console, you have a PS5, you want to take advantage of this, right? They got you covered. Creation Club content is here, and this marks the end of an era. The year is 2022, and Bethesda's done it again! This time, Skyrim Anniversary Edition has released on Switch. Will it ever end? Who's laughing now? I mean, we're all thinking about it and talking about it, so here I am. No one's played Skyrim as of late, right? It's not like we have a million and one versions. No, I thought I would remind the public about Skyrim. So now that you forgot about it, We'll dive into a brand new game as we always do and see just how well it's actually aged. I mean, this scene is the, the main reason I'm firing up a new game, by the way. I'm, I'm doing this for you. We've taken this ride a bajillion times, but there's one line, one line that makes it all worth it. Say it to us. Say it, say it, say it, say it. You are finally awake. There we go. A Nord's last thoughts. That part's actually good because he's... I'm from Rorikstead. That part's great because he's just realizing somehow, just realizing now that, oh, wait, that's Ulfric Stormcloak. We're going to die out here. And uh, I just, again, love how he goes, your last thought should be of home. I can't wait for the most uninspired escape of all time here. No, I'm not a rebel. You can't do this. <laughs> You're not going to kill me. Boom. Just like that. I remember this was the moment I got goosebumps. When I first played this game, I was a junior in high school. I had spent a lot of time reading previews about the game, and it felt like this just figment of my imagination and nothing more, as if it would never come to fruition. And I don't know if anyone ever experienced what I call a gamer's high, where when I had played this game... Um, for the first time. I was so excited. I was planning to stay up all night. It came out on a Friday, which was really rare back then. But I remember being so excited. I think I was going to stay up all night. And yeah, your, your boy ended up like crashing an hour later. Like I had so much excitement built up. It all got released and I just boom, crashed. So my all nighter was over, but I got up early in the morning. That's a rarity. And when I got up really early, that's where I played this game a ton. I always love, where's the war paint here? It's the one that looks like a teardrop. Right there. That's my favorite one. I, I did this in red like that. I, I always thought this looked cool. It's funny because it's more like war focused, but I, I play as a, a high elf. Or no, I played as a wood elf usually because I love the... No, 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 no. It was a high elf. I always go by looks in in this game because while the, the perks are clearly something you should pay attention to when you're doing an official build, I'm all about style 
in these games. I don't know if it's a common thing, but I, I'm going to keep moving on before I embarrass myself further. I do remember having a lot of trouble with the hairstyles for the high elves because you know, almost everything is a McDonald's M. Okay, there we go. That one's all right. It's definitely evil villain looks here. Definitely evil villain. That's pretty good. And yeah, we can rock with that. When you put facial hair on a high elf, you immediately are a criminal. I don't think I ever met a high elf with facial hair that didn't screw me over in a quest line. And as tradition dictates... You are not with the Falmer Embassy, are you, high elf? No. One of the rare times they acknowledge your race in this game. This game does streamline, as you all know, some of the role-playing mechanics, for better or for worse. I'm sorry. We'll make sure you remain so return to the Somerset Isle. I like that too. Somerset Isle, cool little callback there. Ladies and gentlemen, this step out moment, I don't know where you'd put it on your scale. It's funny. Skyrim is one of my favorite games ever made. It's one of the best Bethesda Game Studios games ever made, but it doesn't have a great step out moment. If I were to put it on a tier list, like I'd probably put it in the C area because it immediately forces you down a path, as you can see here. Immediately, it beckons you to go to Riverwood, as Ralph is saying here, but there's not a lot of... Let's go back up to the top here. You step out, right? You step out, and there's not a lot of you left, right. Your back is against the wall. I always talk about the back against the wall. The sense of openness is what makes a step out moment really great. Now, what you can appreciate, especially in the special edition, the anniversary edition, the draw distance, you can see the peaks over there. And just like Todd Howard said, you see that mountain, you can climb it. There is that degree of, oh my gosh, I can go anywhere. So it's definitely a different design of a step out moment. But I like when the world really presents itself to you. And I feel like in a game full of mountains, all they had to do was put me a couple of miles higher and it would have been an ultimate step out moment. But what it does is it ushers you down a path and you always end up, as you'll see here on the top bar, I go towards that mine, I go to Ember Shard Mine. Nah, we're not going to do that this time. It's, it's too much of a familiar path. But I know a lot of people do like the step out moment in this game. It's not necessarily bad because you can kind of see the whole tutorial area. Like Bleak Falls Barrow is right there. Not always, but in a lot of games back then, you'd look at something like that and think, well, certainly I'm not going to go there. But as you get there and it comes into sight and you realize all the detail that you saw from afar starts to fill in now. It is a cool moment. I feel like this is one of the few games that got that right, where you do see something in the distance and you can truly go there and it captures that feeling. As always, we appreciate that off the beaten path environmental storytelling. You see here, we got a camp, a skill book. Of course, you just read those. I don't know if anyone ever actually pages through those. I'm, I'm typically a lore junkie. I should really dive more into Elder Scrolls lore. I, sh I should because, of course, I'm going to cover Elder Scrolls 6, but... For me, it's just like the Fallout lore is what calls me more. And as you loot their camp, right here, you get ambushed by bandits. It was a, it was a trap set up for them. That kind of dynamic gameplay to me was such a game changer back then. It's what really made it stand out from the pack. The, uh, the loot loop I'll show you as well is another reason why. But I just love these moments of, holy crap, I'm just being ambushed now. It's happening in the open world. Maybe not impressive nowadays, but back then, super cool. I don't care what Skyrim player you are. Healing, your best friend early on. I don't know anyone who didn't start this game and not use healing. What's a milk drinker like you doing out here? Go home to your mother. <laughs> hey, your mama. Never should have come here. Yeah, don't make fun of my mom then, bro. Man says I never should have came here, but like, dude, you talked about my mother. Called me a milk drinker. Unbelievable. Anyway, thanks for the armor, bro. There was actually a recent interview with Todd Howard. Uh, it was done by IGN's Ryan McCaffrey. And he was asked about on Skyrim's anniversary if they felt they got anything wrong. And while these aren't his exact words, he kind of got into the idea that some of the exploration and interaction and systems within Skyrim, they still had a long way to go with them. They weren't as deep as they would like. And I think there is some truth to that. But I also feel this is a perfect area we're in Pine Watch Inn. This is a perfect area to indicate where Skyrim has its strengths, which is its sense of interconnectivity in an otherwise large world. And it does come through interaction here where you press a button and boom. You thought you were inside an inn. You got attacked by a bandit, which is here. And you go down into these caves. You hear the dungeon completion sound. You're thinking, 
But where am I heading now? This is uh, nowhere like I thought it'd be. For some reason, though, even though a bandit's occupying the place and you're inside there, you could still be counted as stealing objects from people, which I know rubs certain role players the wrong way. But to me, this is what makes Skyrim not surface level deep. It's not as deep of an RPG as maybe Oblivion would be. Um, Oblivion is definitely deeper on a gameplay level, but what this offers is some, I think, deep and rewarding exploration. And this is why I feel Skyrim systems may not be as deep as Todd wanted. Because as you saw there, my one-handed went up because Skyrim has a leveling by doing system. This lends itself really well to combat. Even to this day, I think combat feels good in Skyrim, not because the actual systems in place like blocking magic, stealth archery, or as you're seeing here with melee, it's not necessarily feeling good that way. It's because as you accomplish a task, you do get better at it. However, it only feels good in combat because the other ways you explore the world are finding a key, pressing a button, or when it comes to your skills that do level up by doing, lockpicking is really the only one that allows you to interact with the environment differently, as we'll see right here. This is very different from even something like, say, Fallout, which had, and I don't mean to sit here and toot Fallout's horn, but Fallout has persuasion checks, which this game does have a speech option, but it's not used often. But in the terms of interacting with your environment, it has hacking, it has lockpicking as well. So it's a small number still, but it is double what Skyrim's offering, despite it being uh, a, a older game. And I think that's kind of what he was getting into a bit, which is that Skyrim needs a little bit more oomph in how you can interact with its world, how you can role play. Because role-playing isn't always just in speech. To me, I think some of the best role-playing games are like Wasteland, where every skill at your disposal um, is something you can use to solve a problem. So if I'm good at one-handed, let that be something I can use in speech more often or use in the dungeon more often to unlock an area that is hidden off to me from me. Uh, that type of stuff, I think, is where Skyrim misses out. But the trade-off is, and again, you got to think back to 2011. We're talking about it now in 2022. The trade-off is... You get something here that is open and explorable and deep in its own ways um, where it had to focus its attention elsewhere. Again, not a bad thing. I'm not going to sit here and tell you Skyrim's bad or anything. I just think Bethesda's RPG systems gradually became more and more watered down, as I'm sure we're all aware. And Fallout 76 really being the pinnacle of that. But even in the terms of combat here... You get level by doing, which was kind of already there in Oblivion, but you also miss on things like custom classes, right? Everyone loved custom classes in Oblivion and Morrowind, where you truly shaped who you were and how you played. Uh, so that's where I think Todd does make a lot of sense in saying there was a long way to go with Skyrim. And I think with what we're seeing from Starfield, in the terms of how they're talking about it right now, Maybe we do get that Bethesda back that values role playing on m multiple angles. That sound there is such a game changer. The completing a dungeon sound, you know, okay, I'm at the end of all of this. So now we have our key. We can unlock this treasure room over here. And we're inching our way. Whoa. Somehow I didn't get hit for a while there. We're inching our way closer to what is one of my favorite things in skyrim one of those things being this here the end of the dungeon loot I, I don't know i'm not a loot guy that's the thing i'm not a loot guy but skyrim i think it's a mixture of environmental storytelling as you go through an area and then concluding it with some just awesome stuff like they don't hesitate to give you good stuff and especially when you find a, a legendary a rare unique that's the good stuff. I think Bethesda got carried away with the looting, though, after this, as we know with Fallout 4. They did introduce the actual legendary tier system, which that was not a good thing to add in because it was a, a replacement for what was the unique weapons and armor that, that I think define these games and make the looting all worthwhile. But to my actual point, this is what I love. So we just came from the Bandit Sanctuary. You find this barred door. You pop it on open. And you're back where you began. That full circle design is implemented throughout almost every dungeon, unless it is minuscule, almost every dungeon you will explore in Skyrim. 
And it's what I think kept me so invested when I played this game in high school. Because you just quickly are back out into the open world. Probably that wasn't even 30 seconds. And now, boom, we're back. You see the map? Boom. Icon at the top. What's that cave? All right, I'm going to head there next. It's that exploration loop that defines this game. This is one of the few RPG titles I can say is truly about the adventure. It's got its loose role-playing elements in the terms of builds, more so on the gameplay front. You don't get many, if at all, story choices, right? You get the choice in the Civil War between the Imperials and the Stormcloaks. Even that, it's really an underwhelming storyline. You can't get invested in it. But you get some cool dynamic moments like this where it doesn't feel like a Ubisoft game where I'm being harassed endlessly. And maybe it's just because these games are easier, so that helps. And the difficulty is a little more manageable um, because Bethesda does have a bit of a, I put it in quotes, like a rubber banding issue in some of their older games. I don't think Skyrim is ultimately that bad until you fight the Frost Trolls, unless you've already put a lot of hours into it. But that's why I always stay engaged with this game. And I think why we get that Skyrim fever, we like to all call it, because it's a mixture of that exploration loop, that loot loop, and the game just kind of poking you. I know that may be taken out of context. Todd's poking you a bit here. But it's just a matter of that little nudge in the right direction, whether it be the map icons or someone coming out to attack me that make it such an easy game to fall in love with all these years later where you fire it up and go, man, here I am. I'm 20 hours deep in another Skyrim playthrough. Why is that? I mean, it's a beautiful game for starters. And it's hard not to love the world. There's so many memories baked in here and so much to explore where it does have that element of some of my favorite games of all time, which is when you go back to it, you have those occasional peppered out moments of, wait, this is in the game. I had no idea. And for that, it just has my heart, you know, hundreds upon hundreds of hours. Has it become egregious when it comes to the amount of times they've sold it? Yes, especially now with the $70 Switch version, 100%. But there's a reason people love this game. It is truly timeless. And I've even shown you the dragons, which you're all too familiar with now. The dragon shouts. Of course, the Dark Brotherhood storyline. I love the Thieves Guild storyline in this game. As always in Elder Scrolls, the guilds are the pillars of the world more than its own main narrative, which is a really unique narrative design in its own right, because not many games are structured in that way. But as you see here, this is Skyrim in 2022. Still beautiful, still fun, semi-flawed, but that's what happens with age. You just learn to appreciate its flaws and take them as they are, because this game was revolutionary. That's all I have to say, though, about Skyrim. I am looking forward to seeing your thoughts down below. So do fire away. Other than that, be sure to follow me on Twitter. Follow me on Instagram. Those links are in the description down below. And a big thank you to all the patrons, all the members who continue to support the hell out of the content here. Stay sexy. Stay active. I love you all. Peace.